Hi, I'm Melissa Johns. Hi, I'm Caitlin Tomaselli. And it's our pleasure to welcome you to Indigenous Digital Development Day, or DDD. DDD is a jam-packed day of online programming to take your creativity and career to the next level. As a continuation of our annual Festival Industry Days, Indigenous Digital Development Day demonstrates our commitment to fostering talent and training for Indigenous filmmakers and digital artists at all levels in their careers. Many thanks to Ontario Creates, RBC, and East Side Games for their support in making this day possible. Enjoy the event! Enjoy the event! Ani, Bojo, I hope you're ready at home with Bannock for today's event. Welcome to the DDD Lunch and Learn with Nikki Little as our moderator. Today, we are connecting with Josh Nielsen, Ashiver Swami, and Jeanette Rogers. Enjoy and bon appetit, courtesy of East Side Games. Welcome to Indigenous Development Day. My name is Nikki Little, Washki Mayangan, and I'm the Artistic Director at Imaginative. I'm Anisha Ninu from Kisigan First Nation in Northern Manitoba. So at Imaginative, we acknowledge that this land, located in present-day Toronto, is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Windat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We acknowledge the Dish With One Spoon Covenant, a treaty whose spirit is based in the collective stewardship and reciprocity. We take the spirit of this covenant to the core of our operations as we bring artists and audiences from many nations across the globe together through our various initiatives and activities. Please take a moment to think of the land you currently reside on from wherever you may be logging on and acknowledge those who came before and those who have yet to come. I am so, so excited to introduce our keynotes for today's Lunch and Learn. We have Asha Reswame, Janet Rogers, and Josh Nielsen. Hi, everyone. There you go. Just to give a little bit of background of everyone, Asha is Haudenosaunee and from the Seneca Nation of Indians and is also a creative practitioner working in visual, augmented, and mixed reality, specializing in social and collective experiences. Her work fuses art, design, and technology to develop scalable immersion. Later this week, we will be featuring her work that allows Indigenous creators to create, collaborate, monetize their digital content using social VR. We also have Janet Rogers, who is Mohawk, and Tesca Aurora from Six Nations and the traditional Coast Salish lands. Janet works in mixed media genres of poetry, spoken word, performance, video, recorded poetry, and is also a radio broadcaster, documentary producer, and sound artist. And last but not least, we have CEO and co-founder of Eastside Games, Josh Nielsen. Josh has been working and specializing in games for the past 14 years and grown his studio from 14 to over 125 all the while keeping community-driven culture strong. Among other awards, Eastside Games was recently announced as the winner of the first ever Business of Good Awards in BC Business Indigenous Prosperity category. As you can tell, we're bringing together a diverse keynote in order to take a cross-disciplinary view of technology and creativity, digital influences, and overcoming obstacles in the industry. We will also be having a live Q&A, so afterwards, Please keep your questions coming in the live chat and we'll have some time afterwards to follow up. Welcome everyone. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to meet everyone. Definitely. Where's everyone logging in from? From the Res, Six Nations of the Grand River, uh, very close to the um, new credit uh, reserve that you made uh, acknowledgements uh, for. So yeah, hello from the Res. I'm logging in from South Carolina where I'm visiting extended family. And then how about for you, Josh? East Vancouver from our home. Nice. Well, I'm so happy you're all here today. So one of my first questions is, is everyone has been working in such different areas. I want to see if you all want to start off how you found yourself in digital media and within your discipline and sort of the crossovers there. Perhaps we'll start with Asha. Yes. So my journey with digital media started with perhaps my career before digital media. Uh, I was a high school teacher where I taught underprivileged high school students and junior high school students in New York City for over seven years. And it was in this process of working with underprivileged communities that I started to see really what does the digital divide mean. 
And how about you, Janet? My portal was working in radio and just realizing the the scope of that reach, having the personal recording device in my hand and then just kind of looking up and going, hmm, I wonder what else this can do. And that kind of started my journey into sound art, being a a spoken word poet, the voice and the radio and the writing and everything that kind of just seemed to kind of go together. And so- And how about you, Josh? I grew up in a really small town in Northern BC and our family originally moved from the prairies. So I was just going to work in hospitality, forestry, uh, trades. So I really fell in love with writing and I wanted to be a uh, writer, poet, I guess Janet's doing my dream job right now. <laughs> and uh, and then um, over my travels started tech. For those that are have been around since the internet started, I just kind of fell into it and, and wow, you could reach a lot of people with this medium. So I started dabbling in games and I'm here now. Some of the common threads around storytelling, obviously, and connectivity to uh, community was really lovely. I was wondering if you could all speak to indigenous values or uh, your indigeneity. Does influence your work? The easy go-to there would be giving voice or providing a platform for more indigenous voices too. And I see the airwaves, you know, as uh, as another form of territory. It's it's real estate. You can sell air. Uh, and airtime. To me, it was all about claiming a space there, creating space there, and then maintaining the space. And now what's the content that you're putting in that space? And um, for me, it was just always about story. It was always about um, expanding the stories that were told about us and moving more into stories that are by us, for us. For me, my approach goes back to the community. And I really asked the question in my current work of how can I help my tribal community bridge sovereignty from physical spaces into digital places. And that's something that my current piece, Kanotea, focuses on. But this topic of what does it mean to be a minority in the digital world is something that I've come across in different ways. One of my previous works Search Divides Us was about algorithmic discrimination by common search engines such as Google when it comes to people who are Black, Hispanic, Native American, Indian, etc. For me, it's about connection. Being from BC and being Métis, being able to connect back with my cousins and relatives in Saskatchewan and Manitoba that are First Nations that are Métis and such beautiful storytellers. Now in the digital space, being able to learn about games and what multimedia can do is bring a new channel for learning because there's so much information to try to find. It's about discovery. And I think multimedia can be a great channel for people that really want to learn a lot more. And there's lots of really cool stuff to learn. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to accessibility and how you continue to move forward because there are still barriers. How do you ensure that community is still coming forward when we do have some real life barriers in terms of accessibility to technology. If you want to get into games or you want to get into technology, I think the biggest barrier is uh, two things. One of them is just accessibility to uh, great internet connection and equipment. Companies can help in that way and organizations can help in that way. And I hope we can work together to solve this. But then secondary is just the education piece of it to tell people that there is a career. If you're a hobbyist, making games or you're, you're making websites or you're a graphic designer, that's a great career and you can get into it. Where I grew up, that option wasn't really there. There's also a monetary barrier as well, because if you don't have schools in your region that teach that, there's a good chance you're never going to want to follow that career path. There's probably a better chance you'll follow career paths. Your, your family does, your friends do. Uh, and if it's not around, then that's a huge barrier right there. First, the key is having good infrastructure. Janet and I joked earlier that on my nation, we have two primary territories. One of them has good internet, the other one doesn't. And so starting with infrastructure is key. The second thing that I think is crucial is knowledge, right? Knowledge is power and knowledge is a form of empowerment. And so I think it's up to us to be able to share some of that knowledge back with our communities. And it can be tangentially related. For example, I work primarily in virtual reality and augmented reality, but when it comes to COVID in the digital world, most people don't really need help with that. What they need help with is like, okay, how does online banking work, right? How do I Zoom call? 
And so I recently hosted a workshop uh, on Cattaraugus territory about digital safety and security. If I am going on about radio, I just want to give a little shout out to Jason Ryle, a beloved uh, ex-artistic uh, director of uh, Imaginative, who gave a space for uh, radio and radio arts in the Imaginative Festival. We're fortunate that we have two uh, radio stations located on the res, and the other is Castle Radio. But CKRZ has been the grassy rootsy um, station, and that station has been going through ebbs and flows of struggles and successes. And um, the more that it struggles to stay on the air, the farther it gets away from community. You know, we are talking about challenges and keeping community connected in media. Currently, it's, it's experiencing quite a struggle. The more that the, the financial struggle is, I found that the farther away from community it became. I tune into Res Radio because I want to hear the res, you know? And, and if you do that and you don't hear the res, it's very disappointing. I was wondering if you could speak to obstacles on your own journey that you've had to overcome. There's certain barriers that you don't necessarily get over sometimes unless you have those insider experiential connections with other people. That education piece is really important, that guidance. My journey was really roundabout and like working in in hospitality for years, which can be a good job. It can also be a grind and moving from place to place and then trying to find your own footing in tech. I didn't graduate from college. I suggest anyone that can go to college or university go because it'll make it a lot easier. Where I was raised, that was kind of the mentality. You either have a trade or you kind of learn it. We try to figure out how to help people get into tech and how to talk about it a lot more to say like that is an option and network. Being able to afford to go to university, I guess, but being able to actually have a plan for that and talking about that plan would be the biggest thing I think I've dealt with. There are two things that come to mind when it comes to personal obstacles or difficulties uh, reflecting to being Indigenous. The first is awareness. I remember in graduate school, I was attending a lecture where there was this uh, somewhat famous anthropologist that came to give a guest lecture. And they mentioned that, oh, and look at the Native Americans, they're all dead now. And I'm sitting in the audience. And so the first thing that's important is reminding people that Native Americans and Indigenous people are still here, right? Mm -hmm. And then piggybacking on top of that, we're here as sovereign nations. And so a huge part of the goal is, you know, going back to education and talking about what does sovereignty mean? And what does being a sovereign nation within the United States mean in terms of our rights? The second issue is it's hard to find documentation and resources about rights. I structure all of my artistic work in an LLC because it's you know a corporate form. But when it comes to an individual person who's making art, there's a lot of questions about, oh, how do I start a company? How do I take care of my finances, right? Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a lack of resources uh, regarding that. One resource that I have found helpful is this is the first textbook that I've seen, and it's called American Indian Business Principles and Practices. And I definitely would recommend this as a resource to any uh, young artists, Indigenous artists especially, who are trying to figure out, okay, how do I um, make money or how do I function as an artist within the Native American world? I would just say barriers of living outside your community, maintaining identity, repping your community accurately when you live out of community. And I did that for 25 years because I was living on Coast Salish territory, actually, Josh, you know, on the island, Vancouver Island, actually. And of course, I was completely biased. I was playing a lot of uh, musicians from Six Nations because there's just an abundance of really great musicians from here. At that time, there was a limited amount of contemporary Indigenous musicians that one could draw upon to play on the airwaves. And, but then really soon after that, like 2008, 2010, it really exploded. It was just about trying to keep my ear to the rail as to the goings on uh, back home when I was living on Coast Salish territory and, and being able to represent myself in, in a true and authentic way, uh, not, not living home. Before the radio had their online broadcast, it was difficult to, <laughs> to, to keep attuned. And even now, again, in, in a really kind of desperate state that the radio station is in, we don't have our online broadcast happening currently. So anybody who's living off res, you can't get the station. Over time, as I was doing the Native Wage Radio show, the station back home did kind of clue in. They go, oh, 
can we syndicate? And so they started to syndicate the program and that, that was a really nice way to come back home. I had a question actually just around, you know, if there's any mentors or anybody that has sort of paved the way for you to be in the position that you're in. I have some art aunties that I like to call them that have really helped me that continue to inform my practice. One of the people is Amelia Bearskin, who been an incredible mentor to me. We went to the same school at different points in, in life, so we're part of the same alumni network. And connecting with her has truly enriched uh, my practice. Another person who has been incredibly helpful is Tom Lasseter, who works uh, mostly dealing with back-end deals of Intel casino kind of things, but hearing his perspective of tribal business, uh, sustainable economic perspective has also been incredibly helpful. Well, growing up, it's definitely grandparents teaching you the value of work ethic, that prairie mentality that you're only as good as how hard you work in a day and obsessed with making us uh, haul wood all the time. I've hauled so many trees and stacked so many trees <laughs> in business. Starting to think about telling stories a lot more. And when I read Jordan Tutu's book, Inuit Hockey Player, I was just like, that's an amazing story. Uh, I'm really into indigenous streetwear companies uh, like Section 35 and the stuff that they do. Modern day storytelling like Jeff Barnaby and the awesome show last year, Blood Quantum at Imaginative, introducing people to uh, a modern take on horror movies with characters they maybe have never seen in those roles. Some of the new stories that are coming out, Tiff and Imaginative, like, like Trickster, I think that stuff is just awesome. I can't wait for that stuff. Brian Wright McLeod, who's Toronto-based, he had uh, the show at Ryerson, uh, Renegade Radio, which aired for many, many, many years. He's somebody who really led the way, him and Andre Morisot, uh, the folks in Toronto with uh, Aboriginal Voices Radio. I would tune in to Brian's show, and that was like the very first time I ever heard Native people you know, autonomously take over the airwaves. So that was that was really encouraging. And again, I already mentioned his name, Jason Ryle, but everybody at, at Imaginative um, who really champions audio art. And I don't have a mentor in, in uh, the sound art work that I do. It's been a lot of do and, and, and learn kind of stuff. Imaginative has provided a platform where that work gets honored and celebrated. And so that alone has really helped me go farther with with that work these times where hopefully we're getting rest we're be able to connect with family and be well what are you working on in your own practices the recent project that i've been working on is kanotaye which is the seneca word for small town or city kanotaye is a virtual social vr city located in the real city of salamanca new york which is on allegheny indian reservation this is a piece that will debut at Imaginative. I'm very excited because to my knowledge, it is the first social VR world that is self-hosted. <laughs> it's definitely been a lot of work, a lot of learning, a lot of diving in, and it's been an amazing process so far. And how about you, Josh? We're continuing to make games and publish games. We focus on narrative idle games. So we make games that are rich in story and easy to play, hard to put down. So our big game is Trailer Park Boys that we continue to work on, very Canadian title. Uh, and we brought that to the world and now we're looking at some very interesting IPs. Our latest game that we just launched is Archer Danger Phone. So working directly with big IPs, but now it's really cool. We're starting to look at bigger IPs, but also some grassroots Canadian IPs and also being able to work with some developers we have the technology that gets your games to market fast. So we'll be able to work with them to get it to market. I focus more on the business side of games, the people that want to do that as a hobby, kind of getting them to, that's your hobby, but this is your core business. I think we're going to do some really exciting things with some great developers this year. I'm working on a CBC comedy pilot about native radio. Learning to design um, in terms of script writing has been really, really interesting. All of you actually alluded to some new lessons. Is there anything that has come up that you could share? Something that someone could, you know, an artist could learn from? Trying to do a story about a res radio station, there's a lot of nuances to share a story in an authentic way, in a real way. Political correctness and, um, you know, communicate that shorthand. And uh, we'll have to negotiate those things. And they want to provide this place where authentic Indigenous voice can be shared.
we can let some things slide. You don't get it, that's fine. That's not for you to get. It is so nuanced from where our own territories that fill in. How do you ensure that those things don't get lost in terms when it goes to moving your project forward? The question of what is tribal sovereignty in the digital world? When I first started this project, I sent an email to Stefan Pivar. He's the author of the book, The Rights of American Indian Tribes. He literally is a law professor and he wrote the textbook on this. And I asked him, I'm purchasing a copy of your book and I would like to know just offhand, do you know of any current legislation on tribal sovereignty within the digital world as it relates to e-commerce, as it relates to internet service providing data? And he wrote back, no, I don't know of any current legislation that exists. The current legislation that does exist is online gambling. My tribe, the Seneca Nation of Indians, as do many nations, rely economically on casino gambling. And so the huge question has been, okay, now what if we housed an online gambling uh, site? What does this mean? So the first piece of legislation that was released about this was released in the year 2014 by the Santa Isabel Nation of Indians in California. They tried to open an online casino. Ultimately, the question came down to, where are your servers located? Their servers were located on territory. However, due to some IRGA and some other laws that happened, California decided to close down their gambling site. Now, a few years later, the same thing happened in the state of New Jersey. And New Jersey decided to respect the rights of the tribes, their servers that were self-hosted, allow online gambling. This is something that is literally being decided right now on a state-by-state -state basis. There's a much broader perspective to be had here. Data is the new gold. It's the new wampum of our world. What are the respective businesses or different art forms that we as indigenous people can use to establish our digital sovereignty within this world? Because the rules are currently being written. Speed to market, I would say. I look at hundreds of games per year, talk to a lot of panels and aspiring game developers and get to market. There's almost too much information now to get to market and to make money. And so understanding all of that understanding what you need to uh, protect from a business standpoint and understand what you'll need to maintain once you put it out. So once you put your, your game, your app out there, what's your plan to maintain that content flow or you're gonna lose those customers? How do you look at your data? The world's opening up and anyone with a laptop and a phone can publish a game and start making money on it, but you have to have a long tail plan to do that. It could be disastrous, somebody could, uh, copy your work. Somebody could um, make another version of that work. It might not have come, come across with the message that you want. I was wondering if, if anyone had any advice you would have for people who are just getting into the digital world. Does anyone have any advice? I think Janet already touched on a really good point, which is, and, and I can't wait till Res Radio comes out. I'm going to watch it and uh, hopefully one day make a game about it because that, nice. that sounds amazing. But I think tell your stories. The world is really at a point where they want to uh, embrace indigenous culture and become a part of it. And I think in a meaningful and good way. And there's almost every sporting team in Vancouver uh, is working with a local artist to do an interpretation of their logo. It's great to see everyone embracing that and wearing that around and being, being proud of it. But I see that a lot in film and fashion, and I don't see that a lot in games. I see there's like almost like a fear of games to have that. Like I want to play uh, Red Dead Redemption, but I want to play it from a different viewpoint. I don't always want to play as the cowboy. Mm -hmm. And so who's going to make that game? Who's going to tell multimedia stories like that. And I think the more that we have, uh, the more you're going to see people embrace it. I can be this character. I could live through this game. I can do that. The stuff that Asha is doing with immersive games is great. We need more of that. And don't think too hard. Just make something small and get it to market as quick as possible and iterate on it. And if you, if you get stuck, reach out and ask. And places like uh, Imaginative and the programs you have are great to connect with people and just ask feedback. If uh, you love it and you want to make it work, what I've been doing uh, has been uh, doubling down and tripling down on my joys.
I love radio. I love poetry. I love sound art. So I just like brought them all together. That has turned into a career for me. I get to do this full time. Think about when you do kind of double down and triple down on that work, that also those pieces can get pulled apart. This is, again, uh, advice that I learned through Imaginative. If you are creating a short film or something like that, think about promoting the sound piece from that film. Think about taking that soundscape out of there and promoting that on its own. And I've come to learn that uh, collaboration is kind of like the new grant. It's really beneficial to work collaboratively with other artists and bring other skills in. There's so much we can learn and it just kind of broadens your audience when you work collaboratively as well. Games always need sound art, uh, media work needs sound and um, radio needs media and on and on like that. So yeah, it's a, it really is a, a circle. In the concept of the circle, I think collaboration is crucial to collaborate with people whose visions and belief systems are similar to yours. And then to also collaborate with people who are different than you, you can create something much bigger and much stronger than you would have been able to do alone. If you want to go fast, do it alone. But if you want to go far, do mm. it together. And so I think that that's really important to those who are starting out is to, you know, work together with your community, work together with your peers and your colleagues and have fun creating, right? Dive in. Amazing. That's a beautiful way to end. Thank you again, Nick Wick, for being here with me today. Shifting to our Q&A, we welcome some questions and make sure you put it in the chat. So today we have Josh Nielsen in a workshop and then later on in the week, we'll have Asha with the social VR. So it's a very exciting week and thanks so much. Yawa, Nikki. Thank you. Yawa. That was beautiful. Next, we have our live Q&A. If you have any questions, leave your comments and we will do our best to get through them all.